All right, so we are in Mark chapter 14, and first verse says, And after two days was the feast of the Passover and of unleavened bread, and the chief priests and scribes saw how they might take him by craft and put him to death. But they said, Not on the feast day, lest there should be an uproar of the people. And I want to point out something real quick here that I have not taken the time to uh, study out yet, but I think from the book of Mark, we can actually get some real solid proof for uh, what day Jesus died on, because everybody likes to argue about Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday. And uh, Mark is actually probably the book we should go to for this, and it's kind of interesting because on chapter 11, that's where we have the famous Palm Sunday. But one thing that's interesting about the Mark's account, we see when Jesus first comes in, that he leaves, and then he goes back the next day on the morrow, and then that's when he drives everybody out and uh, with the whip and all that. So that would have been on Monday, and then we see him healing people, giving some parables and things. We've got the Olivet Discourse. All that stuff happens. That's all happening on Monday, and that goes through chapter 13. Then we get to chapter 14. It says, and after two days. So now we're on Wednesday, and this, uh, it appears it would be Wednesday. And so this would be the day when they would be taking the Passover, uh, uh, doing all of that. But there's actually some things. It's, so it's a little confusing. I haven't taken the time to do my due diligence yet. But according to Mark, it looks like it would be actually Thursday or Friday, which might seem kind of weird. But I, I challenge you, though, go to Mark 11 and just follow the timeline the rest of the way through. There's a lot of specific things in there. And so, uh, and I still have to kind of compare some things with other Gospels, but just a little side note that I never really paid attention to before until going through this. But anyway, main thing I want to point out here, though, in verse 2, at, so after they decide we want to, they want to uh, arrest Jesus Christ, notice how they said, let's not do it on the feast day, lest there be an uproar of the people. And I'd love to preach a sermon right here. I'd love to go full camp meeting right now and just say no matter how wicked government, you know what it is? They always fear the masses. And they knew, hey, if we do this action on this day, the mob's going to freak out. And my question is, when are we going to start freaking out about our government? Because when we do, they will back off. They will leave us alone. But as long as we're just going to be all lethargic and just going along with everything, they're going to keep pushing everything through. Another message for another day. Love to preach it. Not going to do it. Got to stick to you know, the real subject. But anyway, I, I had to get that out there. When I read that, I just saw that. And I was like, man, that's good. That'll preach right there, amen. But uh, that's not what I've been called to preach about tonight. But anyway, verse 3. And it's funny too how they, they'll do anything to manipulate the people. That's what they were going to do. They will all do whatever they got to do and advance whatever propaganda necessary. They were going to take them by crap. They're, we're we're going to have to be sneaky about this. And they did, because we're going to see as we go through this, this trial that they put Jesus through, it was not a lawful trial, not a lawful trial. And I think there's some interesting things that we'll see about that. But verse three says, and being in Bethany in the house of Simon, the leper, as he sat at meat, there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment of spikenard, very precious. And she broke the box and poured it on his head. And there was some that had indignation within themselves and said, why was this waste of the ointment made? For it might have been sold for more than 300 pence and had been given to the poor, and they murmured against her. In the Greek, you'll see that what was going on, what was said there is people on Facebook were posting this very thing. When the, when the peanut gallery on the internet world saw what had happened, they also go on there like, why are they wasting their money? They could have given this to missions. You know, they could have used this to feed the poor. Questioning motives. That kind of stuff was going on back then. Y'all didn't know that, but that, that's in the Greek if you look. And I think y'all know I'm being funny there, but in case somebody doesn't. It says, And Jesus said unto her, Let her alone. Why trouble ye her? She hath wrought a good work on me, for ye have the poor always with you always, and whensoever ye will, ye may do them good. But me ye have not always. She hath done what she could. She has come aforehand to anoint my body to the burying, Verily I say unto you, whosoever this gospel, or wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she hath done, it shall be spoken of for a memorial of her. And right here, this is just a great example showing that the thing, at anything we do for Christ, it matters, it means something. This is a very insignificant thing 
a dead body being anointed and prepared. But that was something they did back then. That was something other people got. And it was something that Jesus necessarily didn't have to have, but somebody had the ability to give it to him. And you know what? She did it. And while people thought it was a waste, Jesus said, you know what? It's hers to do with as she wants. And let me tell you something about your excess that you have. It's yours to do with what you want. It's not for the government to come along and tell you what you should do with your excess and to redistribute your wealth. I mean, don't get me going on the government and everything tonight, but you know what? We see a wicked government in here doing stuff to Jesus, and I just can't see a wicked government in the Bible and not think of America. So forgive me for getting sidetracked, but at, at the same time, it, these things, they are, it is yours to do with as you please. Do not make people feel bad, make you feel bad. Don't let them do that if you want to do what you want to do with what you have. You don't have, it's, it's okay, but let me tell you something, doing something for Christ is extra good. And you know what? Doing things for the least of these, his brethren, is doing it for him. It's the same thing. We don't have Jesus Christ in the flesh here today, but when we do things for his people, especially those who can't do something in return for you, that's a good thing. God sees that. God is pleased by that. And notice too, here's another side note. This is just some ammo for you can use for weirdo dispensationalists and stuff. Whenever they, or just anybody who wants to do weird straw man arguments about dumb disputes and they want to make the gospel exclusively death, burial, and resurrection only, don't you say anything else? Well, Jesus said anywhere the gospel is preached, what this woman did for Jesus is going to be spoken of as a memorial for her. So it looks like that's part of the gospel to me. You know why? Because all the details that the Bible gives us are important. They all matter. And so part of preaching the gospel, apparently, is talking about Jesus' body being anointed for the burial. So uh, just an interesting side note. Throw that in somebody's face and they're being an idiot one, one of these days, trying to prove that they're more gospel-centered than you because they only talk about the death, burial, and resurrection and nothing else. All right, so just hang on to that. Put it in your back pocket. I probably shouldn't give you things like that, but it's just some little ammo you can use on some of these people. So nothing negative can be said about someone who is doing something, especially when it's done from the heart, something for Jesus. And there's nothing negative that can be said about someone using any talent, any ability they have for God's people. And so verse 10, and Judas Iscariot, one of the 12, and we know from the other gospels that this was specifically Judas that said this. It was Judas that was making a big deal about this. And then it says, uh, he went unto the chief priest to betray uh, him unto them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. And he saw how he might conveniently betray him. Now, I think this is interesting too, because they're the Pharisees, they're trying to think, how can we arrest him? Okay. And they obviously, we see in the Bible, the Romans, they had a lot of due process and a lot of laws when it came to things. And so obviously, you know, somebody's got to, you know, bring a complaint. Somebody's got to, you know, a file a complaint or something uh, in order for them to have any reason at all to just show up. You know, the police, they can't just come to your house today and just arrest you. You have to be charged with something, right? And so it helps if you get accused of something. And so I think that's what's going on with Judas, and that's why they're so excited when he comes to them, because he's like, well, you know what? I'll, you know, I'll tell them whatever they want to hear. So ever ye shall go in, say ye to the good men of the house, the master saith, where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished and prepared there make ready for us. And his disciples went forth and came into the city and found as he had said unto them and made ready the Passover. I think what we're seeing here is very similar to what we see with the donkey on Palm Sunday where Jesus said, go, you're going to find one, take it. If anybody asks, say the Lord hath need of it and they'll let you go. And kind of the same thing happens here. Just showing how whatever, anything Jesus need, God provided it for him. And so Jesus tells him, hey, there's going to be a room all furnished, all ready to go. Just go and, you know, if you, you see a guy bearing a pitcher of water, follow him. And you're going to find it. And now, this is a miracle that we're seeing happen here. Okay? That's, and it's just like it was with the donkey. Now, why is that? Okay? This is what we need to understand about what all these things that we're about to see here 
are very important. You know, the Bible doesn't record it just because they're good stories. It's not recording it just because it happened. Remember, you know, this is the gospel here. This is explaining what we need to know for salvation. And I believe what the reason we're seeing this here and the reason God did this miracle in this situation is because this was a very important event. What Jesus was about to do was very important. You know why? Because what was the most important holiday of the year for the Jews? It was the Passover, wasn't it? The Passover, I mean, that commemorated God bringing them out of Egypt when there was that uh, final plague of the death of the firstborn where they were spared if they had the blood of a lamb over their door. There's no doubt that was all pointing to Jesus Christ. And so that, that feast of the Passover, it was always pointing to what was about to happen right then, that very next day is what that was always pointing to. And so it would make sense that you know Jesus would want to participate in really the last Passover ever needed. This was it. After Jesus completes these things, there really is no need for a Passover again. And we should, we should not be observing the Passover. Say, Jesus Christ is our Passover. You know what? I will never celebrate the Passover and you can tell me all you want. I'm violating Old Testament, but you know what? I don't need to because my high priest observed the Passover for me. Jesus did it right here and that's what's important. And then he put an end to it when he was that lamb of God that was slain. So we don't, we don't need to do that. Again, we take the Lord's Supper which is where we remember his body. We remember Jesus Christ. And it is, it's a very simple task because Jesus did everything for us. So I believe that's one of the main reasons we see this focused on in the Gospels because the Passover was a big deal to the Jews. This was the biggest holiday. And so this is showing how Jesus Christ celebrated that, last, that final Passover and how he fulfilled these things. And so it says in verse 17, and then in the evening he cometh with the twelfth. And they sat and did eat. Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, One of you which eateth with me shall betray me. And they began to be sorrowful and to say unto him one by one, Is it I? And another said, Is it I? And he answered and said unto them, It is one of the twelve that dippeth with me in the dish. So nobody suspected Judas. There weren't any, uh, you know, there wasn't a lot of good preaching on the internet then on reprobates. And so nobody had figured out how to spot the reprobates yet. And Judas just kind of slid under the radar. And uh, they all thought it was me. It is I. But no, it was Judas. He wasn't suspected. So, and, and, that, and that's why, too, you hear the line. And I do not agree with this line. But I have heard many people in the past say that Judas was a great soul winner because nobody suspected Judas. That's where that comes from. Okay, When you hear that line... That's where that comes from. It's an old IFB line that's been repeated throughout the years. And it's basically just their way of saying nobody suspected Judas. You know why? Because he was a good disciple. You know, he tricked everybody. He's like these false prophets out there. You know, that say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, in thy name, cast out devils, and thy name done many wonderful works. Okay? That's where that line comes from. Okay? It's just nobody really knows. Okay? No, it's just... It's just something people suppose. And in the Baptist world, if the right preacher supposes something and preaches something and says something, it becomes sound doctrine. Okay? And uh, so it's, you know, it's just one of those things people say that's just not really based on a lot of fact. Okay? So, but that's where that comes from. Uh, and, and that's just their way of saying nobody suspected them. And it's another thing, to, reason, another reason that gets said too is because then... It's a good way to say, to all the, you know, when you need to get some of your church members saved because they hadn't had any salvations in a while, it's like, you know what? Probably got some here tonight that, you know, think they're saved. Been saying they're saved. You got everybody in the church convinced, just like Judas had all the other disciples convinced. But the truth is, you haven't really got it. You haven't really repented of your sins. And then, you know, you get everybody good and freaked out. And then everybody's sitting there, is it I? Is it I? You know? And then, but... Uh, it's just, yeah, it's just bad preaching, and unfortunately, uh, bad preaching happens sometimes in the IFB. So anyway, it says, uh, verse 22, And as they did eat, Jesus took bread and blessed and brake it and gave to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. 
And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said unto them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And I'm not going to talk a lot about the Lord's Supper. We did that recently. But one of these days, we will have a Lord's Supper with Jesus participating in it with us. And I'm looking forward to that one. Right now, we do it in remembrance of him. But someday, we will do it with him, just like the disciples did. And looking forward to that. And notice, too, how Jesus called it, I will drink no more the fruit of the vine. And this is more evidence of the fact that it was grape juice that he drank. Okay? Many times in the Bible, when it's talking about wine, it's referring to the fruit of the vine. It's referring to the juice that comes from the grape. And it doesn't always have to mean alcoholic wine. And folks, I'm getting tired of people creating new realities of what the Bible teaches based on modern day definitions of words. Okay? We got to watch out for that. And sometimes King James only people are the worst. Sometimes we're the worst ones because we're so set that the every word of the Bible is true. And every word of the Bible is true. But you know what? God meant what he said and he said what he meant. And what we have to understand is whatever that word meant when this Bible was translated is what it still means. And if a word changes meaning over time, and words often do, reality does not change. It does not, become, it does not take on the new meaning. You know why? Because this King James Bible, it's a powerful book, but it's not a magical book. And so if we as Americans, as English speaking Americans, if we change the language to mean something else, then the meaning of the Bible does not change with it. And then all of a sudden it becomes good to be bad. You know, that's, that's not the way that works. Okay. So that's an important thing we just need, we need to understand. And it's funny because a lot of the people who try to promote that idea are non King James only people yet. They all want it. When it comes to wine, they make it the Bible, a magical book to where all of a sudden it doesn't matter what the context is. You know, they change reality with it. I think that's interesting how they do it. That tells me they're not honest. That tells me they're preying on the ignorance of weirdo King James only people, you know, to just attack the King James Bible that they don't like. But when it works for them, one of the old def or, or what the modern definitions or the old word works for them, then they'll gladly use it. And it's because they're hypocrites. And that's another subject for another day. But it says in verse 26, And when they had sung in him, they went out into the Mount of Olives. And Jesus saith unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night, for it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered. But after that I am risen, I will go before you into Galilee. And so again, Jesus is specifically telling them he will die and rise again. And he, in this time, he does it right before it happens. I mean, the next day is when they're going to put him on the cross, and yet they still didn't remember. It's just, it's really amazing. And I, I've, I've lost track of how many times the Bible is, or Jesus has specifically told the disciples, I'm going to die and I'm going to rise again. I, I was keeping track, and I lost track at some point. But he told them several times. And so in verse 29, But Peter said unto him, Although all should be offended, yet will not I. And Jesus saith unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this day, even in this night, before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. But he spake the more vehemently, If I should die with thee, I will not deny thee in any wise. Likewise also said they all. And so this very statement that, that Peter made right here is probably what motivates the statement Jesus makes in a little bit where he says the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And we often forget to factor that in. We forget to factor our flesh in when we start running our mouths. And I think it would do Christians a lot of good if they would learn to be, if they would watch and pray before they talk. You know, Christians, they like to get up. I would never do this. 
I will never, you know, and, you know, and a lot of pastors do that. I will never preach this. I will never do this. I will never allow this with my family, blah, blah, blah. They're always like just talking themselves up all these things they'll never do. And then, you know what they end up doing? They end up doing those things. Well, what happened? Well, you know, you're, their heart was in the right place. Okay? These preachers that declare all these bold things that they're never going to do wrong, you know, they meant it when they said it. But you know what they forgot to do? They forgot to factor in their flesh. Their spirit was willing, but their flesh was weak. And that's a very important thing to remember and to factor in uh, before you go running your mouth. And so verse 32, and when they, and they came to the place which is called Gethsemane, and he saith to his disciples, sit ye here while I shall pray. And he take with them Peter and James and John and began to be sore amazed and to be very heavy. And he said to them, my soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Carry ye here and watch. Now, what we're about what we're about to see here, okay? What we see with Jesus' uh, high priestly prayer in the book of John that he does in the garden, I think this is something that we're not completely capable of understanding, but at the same time, I think we can kind of get an idea, okay? But because first off, I mean, why would all of a sudden notice how it says he was sore amazed? And very heavy. He's so, he's so sorrowful. And I don't think Jesus is just talking here. And, and exaggerating. And being dramatic. He said my soul is exceeding sorrowful. Even unto death. He's like I'm about to die. I'm so sorrowful. Okay. Now our, your kids have probably all said that before. Okay. Your wife's probably said that before. You know you've probably said that before. But I don't think Jesus is exaggerating right here. We see that he was dealing with an anxiety that we are not capable of completely understanding, but we are capable of understanding anxiety, aren't we? Have you ever had something that you just really, really dreaded? Something that you were just terrified at the thought of? Maybe you're going to have to have some kind of surgery or you're just going to have to just face something that you knew, or knew was going to be very difficult and you were up all night, you couldn't sleep because you were so worried about something. Well, this is what Jesus is going through right here. And folks, this right here is so important for us to understand, doctrinally speaking, because Jesus, he had to, in order to be a good high priest, we're going to see some verse on this a little bit, he had to know what it was like to be tempted and to be obedient, going against his own will and with the will of the Father. This is something he had, it was, it was necessary for him to face this. And so we've all had anxiety, but here's the, we all, cause we all have things that we fear. And if we had to, if we found out we had to face those things, it would bring a great deal of anxiety. I mean, you know, think of your greatest fears, you know, and you know, I mean, imagine having a child get, got kidnapped, you know, or something like that. That's, that's something I, I hear stories about that. And I just, I can't even imagine what I would do if that ever happened to one of my children. Okay. If that happened, I feel some serious anxiety right then. You know, I, I can't imagine, you know, to just get that horrible news. And uh, many people have had to face these very things, you know, so you take your greatest fear. Well, let me ask you this. What would be Jesus's greatest fear? I mean, because Jesus does, you know, he doesn't seem like kind of be scared of anything. But yet at the same time, we see him very terrified of something you know what it was and this is what we can't really understand and that's taking the cup of sin that's what he that's what he feared that's what was such a dreaded thought to him because look what it says in verse 35 and he went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible the hour might pass from him it's like lord can we skip this i, I don't want to do this and he said abba father all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. What Jesus was about to face, he didn't want to face. Because, and this is interesting too, because one thing we know about the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit is these three are always in agreement, aren't they? They're always, they're always in agreement. But yet here we have a situation where they're not in agreement. God needs him to go to the cross. God needs him to take that cup. Jesus doesn't want to. 
Jesus does that. He does not feel like doing that. You know why? Because he is holy. He is righteous. And yet to take that cup of sin and to carry the weight of a sinner, to die and to be dead for three days and to face a punishment that he created, that wasn't a pleasant thought for him. That was a horrible thought for him. And it was not something he wanted to do. He prayed and he asked God that if there was another way, Lord, if there's another way, let's do that. If, if, but at the same time, he because he was still holy, here he is. Basically, he's got a different will than the Father in this situation, but Jesus Christ is still holy. And so you know what he does? He understands his place that he is in subjection to his Father and he is obedient even though he didn't feel like it. And folks, let me tell you something. There's going to be many, many, many times in our life where we don't feel like doing something that we should do, but you know what we should do? We should be obedient and we should do it anyway. And we don't have an excuse. If Jesus could be obedient in this situation, we could be obedient to anything that we face. We should be able to be obedient to anything that God asks us to do. And this moment was so necessary in order for him to be that compassionate high priest. He had to know what it was like to be obedient to something that he did not want to do. Philippians 2.8 says, where, uh, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. I mean, not just was he obedient and willing to die, but he was even willing to die in the manner that he died. The death of the cross, which was a horrible death. We see in Hebrews 2.17, says, Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people, for in that he himself hath suffered being tempted. He is able to succor them that are tempted. So this was something that was necessary for Jesus to do. What Jesus was about to face, not just a horrible death, but the temptation. Because did you know Jesus could have disobeyed right here. Jesus could have said no and been disobedient. And if he would have done that, guess what? We are all in big trouble. We're all doomed if he's disobedient. But thank God he was not disobedient. And because he, and because he, was a, he did that, because he suffered that temptation, he is able to comfort us. You know why? Because he knows what we're feeling. And the Bible talks about that even with us a lot of times the things that we face, it's so we can comfort those with the comfort that we've been comforted with. And so Jesus Christ, since he has actually dealt with temptation, he knows how to help us. He knows how to get us through these things. And God often asks things of us that are against our flesh or what we want, but Jesus is always there to help us through those things. And so it says, verse 37, And he cometh and findeth them sleeping and saith unto Peter, Simon, sleepest thou? Couldst thou not have watched one hour? Watch ye and pray, lest he enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. And folks, Peter was about to mess up, and he wasn't even concerned about it. And this is another reason we should always be in an attitude of prayer and staying close to God, because while you might not be facing temptation now, we don't know what's around the corner. You don't want to wait until temptation comes to get spiritual. You should be spiritual right now. You should be walking with God right now, and there are sins that we have been warned about that can be a great temptation to us. And we need to take those things serious. So verse 39, it says, and he, again, he went away and prayed and spake the same words. And when he returned, he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. Neither wist they what to answer him. So he went and prayed the same words. That means he went and asked God again. You know, and God's not against us doing that, asking things over and over again. In fact, he promotes that. He wants us to do that. And then he cometh a third time and saith unto them, Sleep on now and take your rest. It is enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. And let me tell you, Jesus, we talked about this the other day when we talked about the arrest and trial of Jesus. He was on his own through the entire process. One more reminder that when it comes to our salvation, Jesus did it all. Folks, we can't even pray right. 
And, you know, and I, I've known people too, they've been concerned about whether or not they got saved because they don't remember what they prayed, they don't know what they asked. Well, you know, as long as your heart was in the right place, as long as you believed in your heart, it really doesn't matter that much what the words are. And even if you butcher the words, thank God for Romans 8.26, it says, Likewise, the Spirit also help, helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with, with groanings which cannot be uttered. You know, I don't know what the best, you know, I, prayer, sinner's prayer is that I've ever read. You know, I like the one that's on our gospel tracks. I don't know what the best sinner's prayer is that's out there. And if you want to argue about that, I'm sure you can find some people that would gladly do that with you. But you know, the truth is, the best sinner's prayer is the one that the Holy Spirit says for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. Did you know, we can't write down the actual prayer that gets us saved. There just, there aren't words for it. We wouldn't be capable of speaking it, but you know what? The Holy Spirit does it for us. And our high priest, he knows what we're trying to do. He knows what we're trying to say. And you know, he comes through and he gets it done for us. That should encourage every one of us. And when it comes to all your prayers. You know, Pastor, I don't know how to, I don't know how to get my prayer answered. I don't know what things to say. Well, it's not about talking fancy. I know that. It's just really about doing it, making sure your heart's in the right place, and the Holy Spirit will help you in your prayer. And that's another good sermon for another day. But I don't worry that much about what I prayed when I got saved. I'm not concerned about that because I know the Holy Spirit helped me. And, and so you're all good there. So it says, verse 42, Rise up, let us go, lo, he that betrayeth me is at hand. And immediately while he yet spake, cometh Judas, one of the twelve, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders, and he that betrayed him had given them a token, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, the same as he, take him and lead him away safely. This is almost as if Judas is trying to betray Jesus without letting Jesus and the disciples know he's doing it. He's just going to go and he's going to join the group again and just pretend, hey, Lord, I'm back. And then go and greet Jesus with a kiss. And then the soldiers are going to be watching. All right, that's the guy that we're going to get. It was like he couldn't even face Jesus and say, I'm betraying you. And let me tell you something about betrayal. and cow They're cowards. Okay? Judas was a coward. He was a very wicked man. And we see in one of the other accounts, that's why after he does it, Jesus just looks at him and said, Judas, betrayest thou me with a kiss? That was really dirty. That was a really dirty way Judas did that. Judas is, let me tell you, People that get called Judases, Judas is a good insult. And it really stinks because that's just the Greek form of Judah. You know, which, you know, you know, that, that, you know the tribe of Judah is one of the better tribes. It was the tribe Jesus was from. But let me tell you, Judas, no. You, no I, I've never met anybody that named their child Judas. I've known some Judas, but not Judas. That's not, that's not a good thing. Even the world knows what a Judas is. It's just, it's basically become a bad word you know what he deserves it he he earned it and it says verse 46 and they laid their hands on him and took him and one of them that stood by drew a sword and smote a servant of the high priest and cut off his ear and jesus answered and said unto them are ye come out as against a thief with swords and with staves to take me i was daily with you in the temple teaching and ye took me not but the scriptures must be fulfilled and they all forsook him and fled and there followed him a certain young man having a linen cloth cast about his naked body and the young men laid hold on him and he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. Now this is kind of a strange detail that we see here and a lot of speculations out there about it, what's going on. People ask a lot of questions, but here's what I think we're seeing right here. Okay, here's why I believe this is included in the Bible is they were just showing how the soldiers were ready to arrest anyone that appeared to be supporting Jesus or with Jesus. That's what's going on right here. And so, uh, and I believe that's why we're going to see here in a little bit that Peter followed afar off. Peter's trying to keep his distance because they were probably going to arrest anyone else. And that's why we see all the other disciples fled. And so when, and, uh, and I'm not going to go into all the details on how this could have happened. Uh, but at the same time, because it's kind of hard to tell when you're just reading the story, but if you actually pay attention to all the details, 
It's easy to see how the disciples would have gotten away, but yet they still would have been trying to arrest anybody that was with them. And I think what's going on, because they're doing this at night, and they don't want anybody to know what's going on because they don't want to uproar the people. But then some guy that was asleep in bed and wasn't wearing, very, you know, wearing his clothes, he goes and wraps a blanket around himself because he wants to go outside to see what all the commotion is to find out what's going on. And then they did. They grab him, maybe to arrest him too, but maybe too because they didn't want him warning everybody in town. Because remember, they feared the people. So uh, don't listen to some of the weird stories that people try to come up with and weird teachings just because of that little detail. I think it's just, just showing they were trying to keep it quiet and they were going after anybody that they saw as a threat in any way, whether it be that they were going to follow Jesus or go tell everybody what was going on. So I think that's what's happening here. But it says, And they led Jesus away to the high priest, and with him assembled all the chief priests and the elders and scribes, and Peter followed him afar off, even to the palace of the high priest, and he sat with the servants and warned himself of the fire. And the chief priests and all the council sought for witness against Jesus to put him to death and found none, for many bear false witness against him, but their witness agreed not together. And there arose certain and bear false witness against him, saying, we have heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. But neither so did their witness agree together. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witness against thee? But he held his peace and answered nothing. And again the high priest asked him and said to him, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am, and ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power, and coming in the clouds of heaven, then the high priest rent his clothes, and saith, What need we any further witnesses? Ye have heard the blasphemy, what think ye? And they all condemned him to be guilty of death, and some began to spit on him, and to cover his face, and to buffet him, and to say unto him, Prophesy, and the servants did strike him with the palms of their hands. So this was an unlawful mock trial that was basically just mob rule that we see going on. And what's incredible about this, and I've talked about this before, but in order for the scripture to be fulfilled, and remember, every detail, every prophecy was important. We're not going to go back and look at them, but think about this, okay? It's one thing if, I, if somebody predicts something that's pretty obvious, okay? Y'all wouldn't think I was a prophet if I predicted the sun was going to come up tomorrow. That's pretty obvious, okay? Y'all wouldn't be shocked you know, if I predicted that Joe Biden is probably going to drop dead before his term's over, you know, you, you all wouldn't be, you all wouldn't be shocked by that. It, you know, it, it, you know, there's a good chance that could happen. It might not, but here's what's amazing about the Bible. It predicts things that you could never guess would happen. And so the thing is, it was prophesied that he had to be put to death by his brethren, but at the same time, he couldn't break any laws. Okay? Now, I said, if I wanted to get put to death, it'd be pretty easy. I just have to go to the right state without a death penalty to do something really horrible. But how do you get put to death by your own brethren when you do nothing bad at all? But yet, that's exactly what happened to Jesus Christ. Because he's got to fulfill scripture, he's got to be put to death, but at the same time, he can't break any law. Otherwise, he violates the scripture and he's paying for his own sins and he can't pay for everybody else's. So again, this is just showing the work of the Lord. This is just showing that this was God's will. And uh, so J Jesus did absolutely nothing worthy of death. And, and this is another thing too. I can talk a lot about this. I don't have time. Okay. And this is important that you understand this. It, and I get it. Jesus died for the sins of the world. Okay. But at the same time, Jesus was an innocent man, he was, and he was the sinless son of God, right? And the Jews, okay, it was the Jews that had him put to death. It was the Jews that did that, and they put him to death saying it was according to their law. Think, think about that. You know, and so if, he, if, if they were putting him to death according to their law, if they were right, Okay, then Jesus can't pay for the sins of the world. But the truth is, them putting Jesus to death, it made it possible for Jesus to pay for the sins of the world while at the same time condemning them as a people. 
And understand, when the Jews as a people had the Messiah put to death, that condemned them as a people. That his blood was on them, and that is why I don't believe in a restoration of a physical peep, a physical of the physical Jew. I don't believe in that. I believe in the salvation of an individual Jew because God has concluded them all in unrighteousness and so that they can be in the same boat as we are, but they will never come back as a people. Not for anything good. They're not going to get anything from God. The Jews are guilty of the unlawful death of Jesus Christ, the just one, and that is why wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. Listen, God cared when Abel's blood, who Abel, who was a sinner, cried to him for the ground. You better believe he cares about the blood of Jesus Christ. And so thank God for Romans 11. An individual Jew can still be saved, but all those who remain a part of that people, unsaved, they will be destroyed unless they become the seed of Abraham through Jesus Christ. Like Nicodemus, they must be born again. And so verse 66, And when Peter was beneath in the palace, there cometh one of the maids of the high priest. And when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked upon him and said, And thou also was with Jesus of Nazareth. But he denied, saying, I know not, neither understand I what thou sayest. And he went out into the porch, and the cock crew, and the maid saw him again, and began to say to them that stood by, This is one of them. And he denied it again. And a little after that they had stood, they said again to Peter, Surely thou art one of them. For thou art a Galilean, and thy speech agreeeth thereto. And he began to curse and to swear, saying, I know not this man of whom ye speak. And the second time the cock crew, and Peter called to mind the word that Jesus said unto him, Before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. And when he thought thereon, he wept. And so Peter's failure in the flesh was a reminder to all of us that no matter how willing we are in the spirit to do the right thing, our flesh is weak. And this is... Also a great example that we could use to prove that salvation, it's not about a desire to turn from sins or a willingness to just give up all and follow Christ. Because I know you can never really turn from your sins, but you need to be willing to. Why? How, so we got to deceive people to think that they can? And something they'll never do? Listen, when I got saved, I never wanted to sin again. I mean, I... I did end up sinning, and the Lord's faithful and just, but when I went to that altar, I, I didn't think I'd ever do it again. Well, you know, that's just, that's just false, okay? Thank God you still got saved while being completely ignorant about theology. You know, you believe in Christ, you're still saved, but don't tell me we got to deceive people into thinking that to get them saved. Because, let me tell you, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And that's why people who do supposedly get saved by repenting of all their sins and turning over the new leaf and giving it all for Christ, that's why they never last and why they always burn out and quit. That's what, because their spirit was willing, but their flesh was weak. Your flesh is always going to fail. It's always going to mess up. And so we have people all over town that have tried repenting of sins. They were willing to repent of their sins. Listen, they got pretty worked up in that Pentecostal meeting when that preacher was going nuts and everybody was running around and screaming. They got pretty emotional during that time, and they did. They they felt really bad, you know. But at the same time, that's not how you get saved. People are going to get saved. It will be because they put their faith and trust in the one who actually was obedient when tempted. We get tempted, we mess up. Jesus got tempted, he didn't mess up, and that's why you believe on Christ for salvation. That is why the Bible emphasizes belief in Christ to be saved, because that is. What saves you? And so with that, let's close the word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for being our high priest. We thank you for uh, facing those temptations for us. And Lord, we thank you for the comfort that you give us in temptation. And Lord, I pray you'll help us to uh, just let your goodness lead us to repentance. And we'll just be grateful for what you did. And you'll help us do the right thing. In your name we pray. Amen.